So now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Ogden Mills, that we all call Dini, Phipps, has served as chairman of the Jockey Club since February 10, <laughs> 1983. It is the longest tenure for the chairman of the Jockey Club. Phipps serves as a board member for the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation and the Willion subsidiaries uh, of the Jockey Club. He is also a member of the Equibase Management Committee. Before becoming chairman of the board of the Jockey Club, he was the chairman of the board of the New York Racing Association from 1976 until 1983. A New York City native, Phipps attended the Deerfield Academy in Deerfield, Massachusetts, and Yale University, the famous university, where he received a BA degree in 1963. He has called Ritz Triumph in the 1990 Travel Stakes, come from behind victories by personal and sign in the 1988 Breeders' Cup Distaff, and storm flag flying in the 2002 Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, and Hobbs Kentucky Derby win in 2013 as his most memorable moments in thoroughbred racing. Phipps was honored with an Eclipse Award of Merit in 1978. That same year, he received the New York Turf Writers Association Award as the man who did the most for racing. In recognition of his successful effort to have the takeout on wagers at NYRA tracks reduced from 17 to 14 percent. In September 2002, he received the Industry Service Award from the TOBA. In August 2012, he received the Earl Max Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation Champion Award from the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation for his outstanding efforts and influence on thoroughbred resource welfare, safety, and retirement, three of our priorities. The Phipps and the Romanet family uh, have known each other for a long time, through two generations, and it is for me a great pleasure to welcome today Dini Phipps. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, Louis. Appreciate it. I apologize for having to sit down. There have been too many surgeons cut too many times on my leg to be able to stand up for, to give this, so if you'll, um, I hope you'll understand that it is no uh, disrespect whatsoever. I want to thank Louie and the other, other members of the executive committee for inviting me to speak. I am honored to follow in the footsteps of three distinguished personalities, the Aga Khan, Bertrand Berlanger, and Nick Nicholson, who have appeared here before me. I commend the committee and staff, French Gallo, for all the thought and effort they put into the creation of this agenda and the exceptional hospitality throughout the weekend. I know how much planning we devote to our two-hour roundtable conference in the Saratoga each August, so I have a deep appreciation for an all-day program like this one. It has been good connect, it's been good to reconnect with many of you and also to meet many of you for the first time in the past few days. And of course, it is a pleasure to be back in Paris. I was here on business several times a year during the mid 70s to the mid 90s, and I've been here for several runnings of the arc. I have vivid memories of L.A. France's victory in 1974. My family has a small memory of the arc. My great uncle, Ogden Mills, won the race with a horse called Cantar in 1928. I've got to say that I wasn't around for that one. <laughs> I was here in 1975 when Intrepid Hero, a horse I bred and owned, ran in the arc. I finished 10th. To be honest, until I checked the charts recently, I thought I did a little better than that, but I guess I remember the 14 horses he beat more than the nine who beat him. <laughs> so for many reasons, it was, it's good to be back at Longshaw yesterday, especially to be the guest of Louis. Our families go back a long way. His father was a wonderful person and he felt a deep commitment to this sport. He was held in high esteem throughout the thoroughbred world. 
Lewis, Louis obviously inherits those traits. My father always con and I always considered it an honor to have Louis and his father as our friend. For the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the Phipps table, I'm, I'll share some background before sir, addressing some other topics. I'm not too comfortable talking about myself, but I'm glad to tell you all about our horses. Over the course of many years, I have been fortunate enough to, to attend races in many corners of the world. I've been to Shan Ti, to many English racetracks, to tracks in Australia, <laughs> Hong Kong, and Japan. Although based in New York and Florida, our family has enjoyed international success at different points in time. Boucher won the St. Ledger at Doncaster in 1972. My mare, quick as lightning, won the 1,000 guineas at Newmarket in 1980. And Posse finished second in the 2,000 guineas the same year. I don't keep track, too close track of these things, but I, I'm told my family has won about 300 stakes races in the US, Canada, and England over the course of the past 40 years. Bold ruler, buck passer, easygoing, personal ensign, and inside information are some of our best known horses. More recently, you have heard of a three year old colt that my cousin Stuart, I, Janney, and I campaigned. His name was Orb, and in May of 2013, he provided us with our first Kentucky Derby winner. Here's a brief video showing some of these horses. Star performer arrives from the barn. The Brooklyn handicap at Aqueduct was to be a sensational race for him. Ogden Phipps and his son Denny crossed the paddock to await the jockeys and the start of the post parade. As he fought his way to the lead in the stretch, Buck Passer couldn't stretch it out. Buffalo held on gamely to make it one of the season's most exciting stretch runs. gets clear by four. Sunday Silence remains in second. La Voyager, the horse from France, is third. It's New York's Easy Goer in front. Ogden Phipps, Easy Goer first. Those two arrive at the eighth pole together with my flag third and trying to close down to the final 16th. Cara Raffaella surges to a short lead. My flag flying late. Golden attraction will be beaten. Here's the line. My flag does it! Inside information, turning it into a runaway. Mike Smith asked her for run, and in an instant, the response was devastating. Inside information, wow, look at this! A colossal victory! And Heavenly Pies, her stablemate, will be second. Inside information won by a dozen links. Orb is coming with giant strides in the center of the track, and here comes Orb on the outside. Now to take the lead as they come down to the 16th pole. It is Orb in front from Normandy Invasion. My loot and Golden Soul between horses down to the wire. Orb has won the Kentucky Derby. Sure like to win another one of those. <laughs> I humbly mention all that as background because those experiences have certainly shaped my perspective on many critical issues in the thoroughbred industry. Like all of you, I have deep appreciation for the importance of international harmonization. This is a global sport, perhaps more than any other, with the exception of soccer and the Olympic Games. Our horses compete internationally. Our horses are imported and exported to and from different countries. There is great international interest and participation in major events like the ARC, the Breeders' Cup, the Bur Dubai World Cup, the Hong Kong International Races, the Japan Cup, our Triple Down, 
Cripple Crown, and the Melbourne Cup, among others. The International Stud Book Committee and the International Agreement on Racing, a Breeding, Racing, and Wagering, which seeks to promote good regulation, best practices on international matters, are immensely important documents for us all. The Jockey Club was, was a founding member of the IFHA in 1993. We believe then, as we do today, that the existence of such an organization helps harmonize rules regarding breeding, racing, and wagering, ensures quality and fairness of racing, enhances the welfare of our athletes, and helps us communicate and exchange best practices. I can assure you the Jockey Club believes strongly in the mission and the purpose of the IFHA, and I am proud of the dedication that Hans Stahl Alan Marzelli, Jim Gagliano have devoted to it over many years. Several of our staff work diligently on international matters and serve on various committees, committees that support the IFHA. In fact, Andrew Cheshire of our Kentucky offices is currently the Deputy Secretary General of the IFHA. Andrew, I want you to keep up the good work. The Jockey Club is one of nine founding members of the International Stud Book Committee, and we participate on the committees listed on this slide. The Jockey Club was created in 19, 1894 to bring a sense of order to our sport in North America. As the slogan says, the Jockey Club is dedicated to the improvement of thoroughbred breeding and racing. This dedication comes in many forms and many diverse areas. Marketing, safety, integrity, welfare are just to, to name a few. On the marketing front, and with the guidance of McKinsey and Company, we have embraced a number of fan development activities with America's Best Racing Initiative as the centerpiece. To entice new owners and retain current owners, we have created an online resource called Owner's View. In the area of aftercare, the Jockey Club played a key role in the formation of the Jockey Club Aftercare Alliance, which accredits and funds aftercare facilities. We administer several other aftercare efforts, just as the Thoroughbred Incentive Program and the Thoroughbred Connect. We have a standing committee called a Thoroughbred Safety Committee. That, that group has issued 20 recommendations since 1908, and many of which you have, been, you have seen widely adopted around our country. Quite clearly and, and by design, we've become much more than a breed registry. Over the course of the past 25 years, we have created commercial subsidiaries that provide vital services to the industry and generate profits to fund Im important initiatives. We, have also, we also operate two charitable foundations. One funds vital equine research, the other provides financial assistance to those needy in our industry. Those are all worthwhile and productive endeavors and we take pride in all of them. In my mind, in my eyes, however, there is nothing more important than our effort to enhance the integrity of our sport. If we don't have integrity, we don't have fans, and if we don't have fans, we don't have an industry. A medication-free environment would be good for all of us, whether the consumer is the investor in blood stock or the gambler. North America, our main focus is reforming our medication policies. We believe and often state that horses should compete only when they are, should only compete when they are free from the influence of medication. Allowing race day medication, which alters the natural performance of a horse, creates doubt on the part of the consumer and we can't afford that. I can assure you that nothing is more important to the Jockey Club at this point in time. 
Research has confirmed that our medication policies in North America are alienating current fans, prospective fans, and prospective sponsors, not to mention animal rights activists, media, and congressional leaders. We have voiced our concerns and encourage wide-ranging wide reform at industry gatherings, on our advocacy websites, in press releases, and in meetings with all levels of government representatives. There has been some progress in the past few years. Several states have adopted some or all of the rules spelled out in the Na National Uniform Medication Program. That program features a drug classification system for controlled therapeutic medications and prohibited substances, accreditation and drug testing labs, and, strict, and stricter penalty guidelines for multiple medication violations. As we announced at the roundtable conference in August, our management team is now in the process of developing and implementing a national legislative strategy, <clears throat> which will include a broad coalition of industry groups and individuals. In fact, I would like to, a moment to recognize Kentucky Governor Steve Brashear, who is with us today. Kentucky uses a world-class drug testing lab, and its commission is considering a rule that would allow tracks in the state to card races that would prohibit the administration of, of LASIKs. Governor Brashear and Bob Beck, the chairman of the Horse Racing Commission, and Tracy Farmer, the vice chairman, deserve a world of credit for their dedication in this, in this area. Governor, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> in our drive to reform, the Jockey Club has also initiated dialogue with le legislative representatives on the federal level, and we're also developing or working closely with Travers Tiger and the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency known as USADA. USADA is a national anti-doping organization in the United States. It manages the anti-doping product for all the U.S. Olympic Committee's national governed bodies, as well as their athletes and their events. It was through the thorough investigation and subsequent report by USADA that led to Lance Armstrong's fall from grace a few years ago. An affiliation with USADA would bring credibility, integrity, and objectivity to our sport. At various po points in time, we have heard cries and calls for a commissioner to oversee the national uh, thoroughbred racing in North America. There are really few organizations today that are willing to do things for the greater good or to put anything before their own self-interest. We have been down this road with a commissioner, such as the model in American football or, and baseball, and it's a dead-end road because the commissioner of horse racing has no power in the United States. In the United States, regulatory power has been vested with the 38 states. Someone asked me the other day what I would do if I were asked to be commissioner. Actually, my age would preclude me from that wonderful assignment, so I'm not raising my hand. But if I were younger and took on such a role, this is what I would do. I would set uniform rules. I would ban race day medication. I would supplement strict penalties. Above all, I would speak with one voice on behalf of all thoroughbred racing. The challenge of reforming our medication policies would certainly be much easier if there was one centralized regulatory body rather than 38 individual racing commissioners. The New York Times all often refers to the Jockey Club as one of, them, of horse racing's most influential groups. We take that as a compliment 
and we remain dedicated to that single goal that I mentioned earlier, the improvement of thoroughbred bracing and breeding. The challenges the Jockey Club faces are really collective challenges that every organization in this room faces today. We must all protect the thoroughbred breed. We must ensure the integrity of our sport. We must all respond to competition from other gaming and entertainment activities. And we must safeguard the welfare of our horses even when their racing and breeding careers have ended. When you leave here today, please know that the Jockey Club will continue to advocate for all of those things, and especially for medication reform in, the, in North America. At the same time, we pledge to continue working closely with the IFHA and our international colleagues, and we sincerely appreciate your support and your assistance. The collaboration and uniformity demonstrated by the 60 member countries of the IFHA is extraordinary. It gives me hope that 38 states in the same country will follow that example and that they will do so sooner rather than later. In the meantime, I applaud all of you for your ongoing commitment to this sport and to the international promotion of racing at the highest possible standards. Louis, again, thank you for having me here today. It is my honor to be among all of you, thank you for your attention. Denis, I want just to thank you. Because sometimes people are saying that uh, we disagree. But uh, when I see what you've been declaring, I could sign immediately the petition and be the first one because I subscribe to 100% of what you said. And I want to take also this occasion to thank you for the marvelous support we get from the Jockey Club of USA for IFHA. Uh, and as I said this morning, we, without this support, uh, we couldn't carry on our missions. And uh, we have exactly the same priorities. And I hope the voice will be heard and that when we come to New York next year for the Pan American Conference, you will have good news for us. <laughs> we'll be working on it. <laughs> thank you, Dini. So we'll start the first uh, afternoon session. We have two afternoon sessions uh, chaired uh, as a moderator uh, by two of uh, our vice chairmen. The first one will be uh, chaired by Brian Kavanaugh. And we thought it was a good time uh, to uh, come back on a subject that we've been discussing in the past, many years ago, uh, which is the question of racetrack surfaces uh, and safety. Uh, we uh, look uh, very often about medication, but there is also a very important aspect for the integrity of racing and the safety of horses and jockeys, uh, which is the, the problem of race track surfaces with a lot of new synthetic tracks which have been developed over the past year, which have been taken away over recent years, and we thought it was the right time uh, to have uh, a debate uh, on the subject, and I'm pleased uh, to give the floor to Brian. Thank you, Louis. We must safeguard the welfare of our horses. Uh, Mr. Phipps' uh, words lead very neatly into a discussion on racetrack surfaces and safety. Uh, before we start, Louis and Bertrand, can I just say thank you very much for uh, wonderful hospitality and a wonderful race yesterday. I'm honoured to be able to say I was there when Trev won her second arc. I think we saw history in the making yesterday, so thank you very much. Um, as Louis said, we're going to speak today on a subject we've revisited before. Uh, and we're lucky that we have two of the superstars of our sport, one maybe better known than another, uh, to, to, to help us today. Uh, Dr. Mick, Mick Peterson, I will introduce him formally later, has been described by TDN as the premier specialist in North America on racing surfaces. And of course, Mr. Graham Motion is well known to all of us as a Breeders' Cup and Dubai World Cup winning trainer. Uh, prior to their presentations, I'll give a brief background and some, uh, and some introduction to the topic. Does an ideal racing surface exist? Given the global nature of our industry and the high level of movement of horses, 
could we or even should we be trying uh, to decide whether one surface should prevail as the ideal racing surface, the best racing surface. I think all of us who work in racing deal with issues to do with ground and going on a day-to-day -day basis. I think if you walk 10 trainers up the straight of the curra, you'll get eight different opinions about the state of the ground and the state of the going. We'll also look at the factors that impact on the presentation of various ra racing surfaces. For the purposes of today's discussion, we will look at three surfaces. Dirt, uh, which is common in America. Turf, uh, which is used all around the world. And more recently, synthetic. You will al also see sand sometimes as a description of a track. And that is very close to the US dirt uh, tracks. The style of racing differs between the surfaces. And our speakers will go into more detail on the differences later. Just to give you a brief visual of each, here's a short clip from NBC illustrating the three types of surface. Welcome to Racing 101. I'm Joe Christofek. This is a traditional dirt track. As we come over here, we find a grass course, otherwise known as turf. And recently in horse racing, a third surface was introduced, a synthetic surface. This one is called polytrack. It's made of silica sand, rubber fibers, and it's bound together by wax. Some horses handle all three surfaces. Animal Kingdom is one on turf. He won the spiral on polytrack last year and went on to win the Kentucky Derby on traditional dirt. For Racing 101, I'm Joe Christofek. That's the first big hurdle of the day um, crossed. Uh, the video worked. Um, as you can see, uh, le the legendary Irish trainer Vincent O'Brien was probably one of the first to experiment with uh, artificial surfaces. Uh, his intention was to create a training surface that was consistent, irrespective of the weather. As Louis said, uh, the issue of racing surfaces has been much in the news in recent years. As we know, Delmar and Keeneland are both returning to dirt from a synthetic surface. These are both future Breeder Cup host venues. And interestingly, a new generation dirt racetrack has been, has been opened in Keeneland last week uh, and uh, is racing now for their fall meeting. Maidan is also reverting from uh, uh, dirt to synthetic surface. In the UK, Wolverhampton has replaced its synthetic surface after 10 years with a different brand of synthetic surface. And also in the UK, there are plans for two new synthetic surfaces, one at Great Lees, which is now known as Chelmsford City, and one at Newcastle. So the issue of the surface of racetracks has been making news uh, uh, everywhere, really, uh, and in the racing press. Not just in the racing press, as you can see, it's also drifted into the mainstream press as well. It's not just an issue about synthetic surfaces, as I said earlier. Uh, everyone has an opinion about the going, and turf is also a topic of uh, a, a debate. It's made headlines in respect to the effects of weather, the effects of watering, uh, unhappy punters regarding track consistency, and some high-profile fatalities on turf. The history of the development of synthetic surfaces in my part of the world uh, started uh, as a result of a, a very cold winter in Britain. I think it was 1984, uh, when 92 race meetings were lost to weather. That was te almost 10% of the race uh, fixtures. Uh, the betting industry could not um, continue to operate like that, and uh, moves were, were introduced to develop the first all-weather racetrack. And I was quite surprised to see last week, coming through my email inbox, uh, a press release announcing the 25th anniversary of all-weather racing in Britain. Uh, as I said, climate was a major factor in the development of all-weather tracks. And in this year's fixture list in Britain, 36% of the flat races uh, run in Britain will be won run on all-weather surfaces. Outside of Europe, the use of synthetic surfaces is also increasing in some countries, generally where turf racing dominates. Here are some headlines showing recent installations in various locations, from South Africa to Australia to the new track here at Deauville in France. In terms of safety, the various bodies carry out their own monitoring and recording of safety data. Here's an example from the US Jockey Club on equine fatalities occurring on each surface. The BHA also keeps statistics as well. I think it's interesting to dwell on the right-hand column of that, that, that a chart which shows the uh, fatalities per 1,000 starts. And as you can see, they compare them by different surface. And it comes out that synthetic would appear to be, on those statistics, the safest surface on which to race. 
I should give a health warning. That's only a, 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 a sample of tracks. It's not full information. And obviously, there are factors involved in fatalities on the track that have nothing to do with surface, heart attacks, or various other issues like that. But over the period of 2009 to 2013, the average fatality uh, in the U US per 1,000 runners was 1.91 horses. And that ranges from 2.08 on dirt down to 1.22 uh, on synthetics. Uh, the British statistics also support uh, the contention that synthetic uh, surfaces have less fatalities than turf surfaces. There's been a number of published papers on the safety of racetracks, including one involving uh, our guest speaker here, Dr. Mick Peterson. Uh, and various racing bodies have looked out and carried out academic research, and Mick will give us a, an insight into some of the work which he's carrying on later on. As we've seen, it's a global topic, racing surfaces, so I thought we would take a quick look at the racing surfaces that are used in some of the major jurisdictions around the world. In Europe, it's predominantly turf. There are some synthetic tracks. As I said, there's four in Britain. There's a number in France. We have one in Ireland. And there are a small number of dirt tracks in, 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 in Europe. We saw one this morning in the presentation from Jägesero in Sweden. Uh, oh, I've got the pronunciation right. Jägesero. UAE is a country which races on all, all, all surfaces, dirt, turf, and synthetic. Looking at Asia, Tokyo uses both a dirt track and a turf track. The Japanese Derby, the Oaks, and the Japan Cup are run on turf. While in Sha Tin in Hong Kong, there's a turf and a US-style dirt track. All the pattern races in Sha Tin are run on turf. In Singapore, the majority of the, uh, the top races are also run on turf. In Australia, uh, the official industry statistics that are presented in Australia show there are 246 turf tracks, 97 dirt tracks, 19 sand tracks, which is very similar to dirt, and five synthetic race tracks in Australia. South Africa covers each of the surfaces in its eight tracks. South America, no synthetic tracks. They race on turf and dirt. And finally, North America, where the subject of racetrack surfaces is probably the most topical at the moment. In respect to synthetics, beginning with Turfway Park, which was the first track to install a synthetic surface in 2005, uh, the peak of the synthetic era, if I can call it that, in North America, nine racetracks had converted. By 2015, the number of synthetic tracks in the United States will be five. Golden Gates, Presque Isle Downs, Arlington Park, Turfway, and Woodbine. A recent TDN publication published in August 2014 investigated the topic in detail and questioned whether this fall off in the number of synthetic tracks represented the death of synthetic racing in North America. And if, if so, why was that the case? In a 20-page article, uh, it was argued passionately from one side and the other. A selection of quotes from that publication are shown on the screen, which show the pro-synthetic view. And this mainly related to issues such as welfare, safety, and those sort of issues. So if it's safer, why return to, to dirt? And why are these tracks reverting to dirt? Those in favor uh, argue that dirt is more suited to the horses. The owners and trainers prefer it. Uh, there are some quotes from some leading figures in the breeding industry. Uh, Will Farish, owner of Lane's End Farm, Seth Hancock of Claiborne Farm, both applauding the return to dirt at Keeneland. Likewise, trainers, and we'll be interested to hear Graham's view uh, later on, uh, feel that uh, dirt is more suited to their horses. Um, there's quotes from Todd Pletcher, Kira McLaughlin, uh, and Bill Thomason, who's the Keeneland president and CEO. He cites the preference for dirt by owners and trainers especially those competing at the highest level and attracting top horses uh, as the major factor in Keeneland's decision. Uh, for some time during the synthetic era, you had a situation where Keeneland's um, trial for the Kentucky Derby was run on a different surface to the surface on which the Derby uh, is run on. What other factors influence the return to dirt? dirt? Do the betting public prefer dirt to synthetic? Quite often you hear people say, People who make a living by gambling don't trust Polytrack. The bettors don't want to bet on it. Having said that, if you look at the statistics, Keeneland and Delmar both registered new records in both attendance and handle in the synthetic era. Delmar's top four days by attendance have come during the last five years, while the top seven days in Keeneland's history uh, came during the synthetic era. So there's two sides to that debate. 
Other questions to be asked and hopefully we can explore with our speakers this afternoon. Has there been a difficulty in attracting top horses and trainers to run on synthetic surfaces, as the Triple Crown races and the Breeders' Cup races are all run on dirt? Were synthetic tracks becoming isolated in the midst of a predominantly dirt national racing programme in the States? Were trainers slow to adapt to racing on synthetic? And has there been an impact on commercial breeding? Do we now have dirt stallions and dirt pedigrees and synthetic stallions and synthetic pedigrees? Again, they're all questions that I'm not expert to answer. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our panelists today, Dr. Mick Peterson. Uh, Mick uh, is a mechanical engineering professor in the University of Maine. Uh, his research links traditional understanding of engineering mechanics and materials to the biomechanics of animals. Uh, Mick is affiliated to the faculty of the School of Marine Sciences and Animal and Veterinary Sciences in the University of Maine. He's worked on a range of equine and animal biomechanics topics uh, across a wide range. However, Mick's greatest passion is for the understanding of racing surfaces and equestrian surfaces in general. He has collaborated with Dr. Wayne McElrath in Colorado State University and founded the Racing Surfaces Testing Laboratory. This is a laboratory which is a non-profit organization funded by the racing industry which provides research, testing and materials services, material characterization services for the horse racing industry. Mick Peterson currently serves as, as executive director and he has published over 75 journal articles, three book chapters, 81 conference proceedings, 82 after today, and has presented 67 additional papers at conferences and received six patents. As I said earlier, TGN described him as, as, as the supreme knowledge on racing surfaces in North America, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from Mick. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to see some, a historic day of racing yesterday and to be invited to this uh, wonderful venue. We're going to start out uh, talking about racing surfaces for safety and consistency. The key here is my focus from the very beginning has been on safety and consistency, and those two go hand in hand. Of the green button. There we go. Thank you. Our goal is to reduce musculoskeletal injuries. I always start with this slide because racetrack surfaces are not really where the primary issue is. It's multifactorial. The risk to, mus to musculoskeletal injury for the horse is from conformation, individual predisposition, pre-existing disease, shoeing, training, and track surfaces on the, is on that list. Tracks are only one factor but they can be an important factor to improve the health and safety and build confidence in the racing product and in the racing uh, surface and materials. Our current practice with track maintenance is to look at pressure from horsemen, regulatory pressures, and public pressure. It's a reactive process where we're responding to outside influences and developing what's needed at that point to make the noise stop. We need to transition to a proactive approach where we systematically plan, we implement standard work methods, and we inspect the word. This is an isotype culture. It's a safety culture and an isotype process. There's a regulatory leadership role that's absolutely critical in this process. The, the goal of the regulatory process is not to define what should be done but to ask what is going to be done and to ask what has been done. This is a question that's being asked as a part of this ISO, this safety culture. And then also ask how the work's being verified. We should be stealing from other safety critical industries. The airline regulatory agencies do not tell you when to, when to maintain the plane. They ask when the plane should be maintained, what you're going to do, and how you inspected it. The same approach is even being seen a lot in the medical world, where checklists are being used in surgery. Oftentimes, it's not the surgeon taking, looking at the checklist. It's a, it's a surgical nurse who's checking off the boxes, counting the number of sponges that are removed or counting the number of stitches that are applied. But whatever we do, we need to base this on the science. This can't be a seat of the pants process. And then we've developed a fair amount of science. The biomechanics 
the, the biomechanics of horses is the start of biomechanics as a field. If we go back to Moybridge, we look at the uh, flight stage of horses. We've, under, we've learned a lot since then. We understand these stages of the motion of the hoof. It starts out with an initial ground contact where there's very little load, but the hoof is coming down at quite a high speed. Then the, hoof, then the weight of the horse is transferred to the hoof. Then there's the loading, which is lower speed, but there's a large load. Two times the body weight of the horse goes onto the hoof. And then break over where the horse has to propel itself, and then flight. There's very different demands on the surface during each of these stages of the gait. During the initial impact, there is a high, there is a relatively low load, and the hoof is sliding forward. If the, hoof, if the horse is moving forward at a speed, the hoof is stopped portion of the time. It has to move twice as fast. So the hoof stops and then goes and then stops and then goes. That's the slide that you've heard about. It's discussed a lot in synthetics. It's discussed a lot on dirt. And it's certainly critical in turf. There's lower forces. We care about the vertical stiffness. And we want this small amount of slide on this hoof to lower the loads on the hoof. I simplify this and say this is really the portion of the gate that's associated with the chips. These are the fractures. These are the chips. However, during propulsion, it's critical that you be able to support that horse. The surface has to be able to give the horse a surface that allows them to propel themselves forward safely. If we do this wrong, we get bowed tendons. So you can't make the horse surface too hard. You can't make it too soft. We need to design the surface to the needs of the horse. In order to do this, we also need to measure it like the horse, because these loads are huge. We're putting two and a half times the weight of a horse on the, on, on the surface. The material is nonlinear, meaning the more you load it, the stiffer it gets, the harder it gets. So if we walk out on the track, we won't necessarily see the same thing that a horse would see, because we're smaller and lighter and move more slowly. It's also strain rate dependent, meaning if you impact it hard, it's stiffer. Anybody who knows what it's like to fall off of a uh, water skiing knows that water is very hard if, you're, if, you, if you fall off water skiing. It's quite soft if you climb into the water slowly. That's the strain rate dependent. Our racing surfaces are the same way. The research needs to be based on a tool that replicates the horse. That's our, that's our focus. We need to focus on the horse. So this is how we measure the surface. We started with the horse. And as we looked at the gait and the transfer, we look at the load. And then we move forward. And you can see on the left hand, on the right hand side, the uh, hoof coming down in a, in, a, in a simulated manner. At this point, we have a comparison of 80 surfaces, including eight synthetic tracks, five turf tracks, and the rest are dirt tracks in North America. We have a standard mes testing method that we use that use, that's done in 40 minutes at 24 locations. And we simultaneously measure these critical parameters. We're not doing this alone, though. There are four machines in the US and Europe. There's one in Sweden at the Swedish University of Agriculture. The California Horse Racing Board has one. And there's a system at the UK at a, at a consultancy that's based at University of Central Lancashire. What we're looking at here is the start of a standard international test method for surfaces that allow the surfaces to be, can be compared between countries. The horses move between countries. We need to, we need to be able to compare the surfaces between countries. But it's not only limited to horse racing. We've now moved during the Olympics. There were two of the machines at the Olympics. And during the World Equestrian Games, we did a series of tests in Khan. The idea is that the horse should be our primary focus. The surfaces need to be designed to protect the horse and provide the trainer with the consistent information that they need to understand the fitness and health of the horse. What the rider feels is the performance. However, safety is musculoskeletal loading. I tell the superintendents, the track, track clerk of the tracks, if they redefine their goal as, re, as a reducing musculoskeletal injury, they will begin to understand what, how complicated their job is. We've developed, working with this team, five functional parameters. Firmness, cushioning, responsiveness, grip, and uniformity. But it's all about the horse. These two videos show the difference between the firmness and the cushioning. The difference is that initial impact that you see in the, in the uh, uh, left-hand side, and the, once the horse has begun to transfer the load on the right-hand side. 
The difference between those two portions of the gate is one's the very top surface that matters, the other one is the base and the deeper layers. Responsiveness is that bounce. That's the elusive characteristic that the trainer is looking for that gives them the speed that they're looking for and the health of the horse. And, uh, and, and then grip, that's the slide. Finally, there's uniformity. If there's one feature that we're looking for that's completely uncontroversial in the track is the uniformity, consistency from stride to stride, from day to day, from morning to afternoon, and from track to track. It doesn't matter whether it's the firmness, the cushioning, the responsiveness, or the grip. After a decade of data and over 6,000 tests on 80 racing and training surfaces, we've got a lot of data on slide. The most notable thing is that we have a lot of statistical outliers. This is the proverbial bad step. Our goal and our focus needs to be eliminating bad steps. The other thing that's notable here, though, is the variability. If we look in these 6,000 tests at the difference between dirt and synthetic, we really can't say that synthetic has more grip than dirt, because some dirt surfaces have as much grip as the dirt. So we're really in a situation where variability on dirt surfaces is large. Variability on synthetic surfaces is much lower. And there, I think, probably lies the key to the differences in the safety. We also looked at the cushioning between these two surfaces. Again, we see a lot of outliers in the dirt. But even in the cushioning, the dirt overlaps the synthetic. The important conclusion is that dirt is more variable than a synthetic track, and almost certainly, this is a function of moisture content. Turf has probably been more in the news as far as consistency and safety in the United States in the last year than our dirt surfaces. We've also linked this same sort of testing to outcomes, performance and safety in the dirt turf. Water is the single biggest variable in turf. Proper surface maintenance is also critical, and it can help make it more consistent. Aeration, top dressing, verticutting, it's down in the details, and it doesn't matter whether you're at Royal Ascot, Del Mar, or what track you're at, it's, they, they get down to a few basic maintenance tools. After a decade of testing, we've got the factors. We have a reasonable approach at this point to say, what do we need to control? If we look at dirt and turf tracks, it's dominated by water. Synthetic tracks, we have aging, the changes in the wax. It's more complicated, but there are still variables. But we need to use this research to, pro to provide a consistent racing and training surface. So our major message from the research, if you remember one thing today, remember maintenance, especially water, needs to be controlled. There's different maintenance for different material. You water, you aerate, you, you add material, or you grade. And the other thing to remember is that the details matter. So coming back to the regulatory role in this, controlling those processes and those decisions is difficult from a regulatory standpoint. But the questions can still be asked. What is going to be done and what has been done? These are checklists. These are used just like you'd use in an aircraft inspection, or we can use in racetracks. We're building a critical safety system every morning when the horses go out there. Preparing the whole track for the, for the morning training or for the afternoon races, it's a critical safety system. That maintenance needs to be done accurately and appropriately. Planning documents. Documents to be used, document equipment, descriptions and usage, and planning. And not only planning for the normal conditions, but there also has to be planning for exceptional conditions. Everybody knows the situation that happens, and it doesn't matter what country, when you go through a drought or a wet period. Those can be the emergency conditions that the planning has to go on. So this is a long-term process. We have variation from year to year, and we have to plan for those years that give us the unexpected, just like you, you plan for the unexpected in aircraft. One of the most important things that's come out of this in the last couple of years in the United States is electronic tracking of maintenance. There's no need at this point for a, everything to be in little black books in somebody's top drawer. We need to move beyond that. There's a, there's a demand from the outside that we be accountable, and that accountability includes keeping, keeping records. There's forms for training. There's forms for maintenance during the, during the day. 
most importantly, probably, is there's a forum for watering. And there's historical data. And the historical data is key to understanding and learning. Making mistakes is going to be a part of this as we move forward, but we can't repeat mistakes. If there's a bad day, we need to know what went wrong and do a reassessment so it doesn't happen. And we need to continuously improve. And the other critical piece, which may seem simple but doesn't exist at most rate tracks, is the weather station. We don't even know how much it rained overnight. If we don't know how much it rained overnight, how are we going to know how to control the water? The most recent effort that we've undertaken is an evaporation model to help them estimate the amount of water that needs to be added to the surfaces in order to give them guidance. This isn't replacing the judgment on the ground of the superintendent. This isn't replacing the judgment that's taking place at the track. What it's doing is it's supplementing the information, just like a surgeon would have supplementary information. And finally, documenting the inspection. This is happening a lot of tracks. We use the more complex equipment for the big days. You've got more risk associated with a larger fan base. You also have all you're also more subject to criticism. But it needs to be safe every day. We need to control the input variables. A lot of these tools are quite simple. We need to measure the moisture content, obviously. Cushion depth mapping has been done for many years at a number of racetracks in the United States, most no notably uh, the New York racetracks. But that's being done now more commonly, and electronic records are being kept. And then when we get to the next stage of this, and this is the, it would be to begin to automate this. We GPS track every tractor, every water truck at the New York tracks, Santa Anita, Keeneland, the top tracks, and we know at that point who's done their job. It's a part of the inspection, it's verification. And then there's a daily activity report. Think about this as precision farming. It happened in the 1970s in agriculture. It's time that it happened in racing. And then tracking in the water addition. I go over and over. There's, there's, this seems to be my one theme. As we look at new dirt tracks replacing synthetic tracks, we need to improve the control of our water. At Santa Anita, we've begun to automate this as well, so we know exactly how much water has been applied at what location to the track. OK, so to reiterate one more time, the maintenance process from a regulatory standpoint is what is going to be done, what has been done, and how the work is verified. These are the checklists before you take off. This is the way we're doing the checklist. That's at Saratoga. That's the uh, superintendent. He's entering the information on the iPad sitting in, his, sitting in his truck. We know in real time what's been done, and we can verify it. The other key to this is keeping track. The goal is to improve, so we know what is going to be done, what has been done, how work is verified. Data, then again, can be tied to outcomes. Injuries to jockeys and horses, effectiveness and maintenance methods, and even equipment labor expenditures. So the critical question, if we look at the sport, is does it perform well? This is a right or response. But even more critical is tying this to the efforts that have been made for safety of the horse and rider. What matters is that we protect them and build the safety culture of, and the confidence in the track and the sport. Thanks. Thanks, Mick. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, We'll take questions after the two speakers rather than uh, now. So our second speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Graham Motion. He needs no introduction for most of us in this room. Graham trained his first winner in 1993, and he's now firmly among the top US trainers with nearly 2,000 career wins and almost $88 million in purse earnings. And I have to say, he added to that on Saturday night because while we were all enjoying a, a lovely dinner uh, in Paris, as Graham and Anita were, he trained a winner of a half a million dollar race in Belmont, uh, which we were able to watch through the wonders of modern technology on my phone. Uh, so it's, it's 88 million and a half now in purse earnings. Uh, Graham was born in England. He, he also said he was here for a, he met his wife in Paris, and they were, this was the first time they'd been back since they met, and the horse was called Ring Weekend. So I think we probably all should have t uh, picked up on the tip. Uh, Graham was born in England. He finished high school in America and then worked for a season at Le Mesnil before going on to work for Hall of Fame trainer Jonathan Shepard in the States for six years. He also worked for notable Maryland trainer Bernie Bond for three years. And in between that, he spent a season here with J Jonathan Peace in Chantilly. So I'm standing Graham here much more similar to what you... 
Graham Stable has been dotted with stars, including, of course, Animal Kingdom, winner of the 2011 Kentucky Derby and the 2013 Dubai World Cup. He's trained the Breeders' Cup turf winner and $4 million earner Better Talk Now and the Breeders' Cup Phillies and Mares turf winner Shared Account and many others. His 2014 stable includes multiple Grade 1 winner and Breeders' Cup turf contender Main Sequence. Graham lives near his base in Fair Hill with his wife Anita and their two children. Graham uh, trains at Fair Hill and he trains on the three different surfaces that we spoke about. So he has turf training facilities, uh, dirt training facilities and synthetic training facilities. Uh, and before Graham speaks, we'll see a, a short video which he's put together of the facilities in Fair Hill uh, and then Graham will come and, and speak to us. I'm standing here with Sally Goswell, who's the manager of Fair Hill Training Centre, where I train about 100 horses. And we're standing in front of the Mile Dirt Oval, and inside the Mile Dirt Oval is a seven furlong tapita. And Sally is going to take us down there and show us uh, what it takes to, to keep up the two track surfaces. Okay, we're standing here in the middle of our one mile dirt track. It is 70 feet wide. It is a standard American dirt track, probably bigger than some they race over and smaller than some they race over. We have 10% banking on our turns, which makes it a bit tricky to maintain in wet weather. So typically we would seal the track and put cones out and only use the outside three quarters of the track. Um, we're now over on our Tapita track. This track is 7 eighths of a mile, also with the 10% uh, banking on the turns that we have on the dirt. However, this one is only 40 feet wide. So it can get a bit crowded over here, here particularly in the wet weather. Um, the track is, we have about seven inches of a uh, sand, wax coated sand, fibers. There is some rubber in our track. There are all bits and pieces of different things that help bind it together. Um, it is a lot different maintenance from our dirt track. It is not maintenance free, but a lot easier and more predictable than the dirt is, I think, because it's not as affected by the weather. In fact, it loves the rain. We have porous blacktop underneath the surface, so the water comes down, no matter how much goes through the material, through the blacktop, and out through drains um, into the center of the track. So we can continue training on this when it is pouring rain um, and the track actually loves the water. So here we are now at the turf course at Fair Hill and we have a seven furlong oval which is fairly typical of most American racetracks although this is used really for steeplechase races and at the, at the training centre we can also use it to, uh, for turf workouts. Uh, actually Animal Kingdom had his last workout here um, before he ran against Wise Dan in the Breeders' Cup and there's a pretty steady climb uphill from three furlongs out uh, so you can really get a, a bottom into a horse much more similar to what you'd be used to training in Europe. Graham. So I have to give my wife credit because she did the video. So. <laughs> I'd like to thank the IFHA and Brian um, for inviting me to attend this and to speak today. Uh, I'm here obviously to talk about racing services in America. And when you think about racing in America, you think about dirt. The, the bulk of our races occur on dirt tracks, the surface of the country's biggest events, the Triple Crown races, the Breeders' Cup Classic, and dozens of other Group 1 races. But that's only part of the story. In America, we race on dirt, turf, and synthetics tracks. We race in all kinds of weather conditions, and we race all year in all parts of the country. In 2011, I was fortunate enough to win the Kentucky Derby with Animal Kingdom, a horse with a largely European pedigree who finished his career with successes on all three American surfaces, including a win in the Dubai World Cup on Tapita. That he won the world's most famous dirt race in his dirt debut is a testament to the horse, and any discussion about racing surfaces in America must put the safety of the horse first because that's why we're here. We now, I believe, have a, a video to show of Animal Kingdom. Defying 54 years of history and the odds makers, 
he would have only six weeks between the spiral and the Kentucky Derby. He also lacked a single outing on a conventional dirt track to get him ready for the big day. Even so, the handsome chestnut proved he was up to the task. Animal Kingdom roaring down the center of the track. Here comes Animal Kingdom in the middle of the racetrack to grab the lead. And then it's Nero and Shackleford, but it's Animal Kingdom and John Velasquez to win the Derby! In only his fifth career start, he won the world-famous Kentucky Derby by nearly three lengths and closed his final half mile in a spectacular 47 and one fifth seconds. Only Secretary, nearly 30 years ago, ran it faster. His history-making Derby victory and excellent Preakness run ensured he was champion three-year-old of 2011. The winner is Animal Kingdom. But for Animal Kingdom, the best was yet to come. After a layoff of 259 days and in the unluckiest of runs, Animal Kingdom mounted an amazing stretch charge in the 2012 Breeders' Cup Mile when he nearly ran down eventual horse of the year, Wise Dan. And Wise Dan strikes the front, sticks his neck out. He wanted to win today and win it he will. Wise Dan, super impressive Breeders' Cup Mile. Wise Dan won it. Animal Kingdom like a rocket will be in a photo with acceleration and obviously... Many in the grandstand thought he may have been the best on the day. His brilliant run in course record time was just further proof that he had become an important horse on the world stage. In 2013, Animal Kingdom traveled to Dubai to compete in the world's richest race, the $10 million Dubai World Cup a glittering night and Animal Kingdom's crowning achievement. American story, the Derby winner. Animal Kingdom in front for 200 meters left to go. Red Godot on the inside starting to flash home. Will he have time? Animal Kingdom leads. Animal Kingdom three lengths in front of Red Godot and Animal Kingdom wins the Dubai World Cup in a US-Australia combination. Animal Kingdom has beaten Red Godot. Third... He dominated the race. He dominated the world. Animal Kingdom was described by his trainer, Graham Motion, as the horse of a lifetime. Animal Kingdom's the best horse I've ever trained. He's done everything from winning on the synthetic to the, the dirt at Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby, and now the, the torpedo in Maidan. He's won going a mile and a quarter twice now. He just got beat in the Breeders' Cup going a mile against probably the best group of milers that was put together last year. He's such a powerful animal, and, and he seems to be able to handle it, anything that's thrown at him. I was very fortunate to have him. He was a special horse. America's raced on the dirt throughout its history, mainly because there were very few options. We don't have the racing schedule to support racing on turf exclusively. With racing every day at extended meetings, the turf must be protected for use throughout the meeting. Dirt offered a more predictable surface to turf that was often too firm or too soft. Dirt can vary from track to track. Some dirt tracks are deeper than others. Some favor speed, some reward closes. Dirt tracks are affected by weather. When it rains, the track must often be sealed to repel the water. This can create a hard surface and can also result in the top layer of dirt being washed to the inside, especially on the turns. In the winter, maintaining a safe surface when temperatures are well below freezing entails constant movement of the dirt, as well as adding chemicals to prevent it from freezing. The challenge at a racetrack versus a training center is even greater, given that the track is used for training in the morning and racing in the afternoon or the evening. At the end of the day, it's American racing. It's what generations of American thoroughbreds were bred to do. Dirt racing is not going away, and I don't think it should. It just seems like times are changing enough to consider other options. Turf is already embraced widely in America. Synthetics are more sophisticated dirt tracks. Where I train at Fair Hill in Maryland, as you saw on the East Coast, Tapita and turf surfaces 
is what we use. Our tracks are not used for racing, which makes maintenance easier no matter the weather. The dirt surface at Fair Hill would be somewhat comparable to the dirt training gallops at Chantilly. In my experience, horses that favor synthetic tracks in Europe tend not to handle the switch to dirt tracks in America, as some might believe, but most turf horses handle the switch to synthetics. An advantage of being at Fair Hill is that we have the option on a rainy day to train on a synthetic track, which drains very well, as opposed to the dirt. In the winter, we tend to use a synthetic exclusively since it handles the cold weather, weather much better and remains a consistent surface. I will try to run my two-year-olds on the dirt in their early starts, but they will train on the synthetic, especially in wet or freezing weather. If they don't show an affinity for the dirt in their workouts or races, I would switch them to a different surface for racing. This is why I think there is a place for synthetic tracks in America, whether it be as a training surface or as an alternative to a wet dirt track. It's a safer, more consistent option. Like dirt racing, American turf racing can be a victim of the weather. We don't have the luxury of running on soft turf because we have to protect the turf courses that are used throughout the year rather than at short meetings as in Europe and some other countries. Saratoga's six-week meeting in July and August is considered a boutique meet in America, but includes nine or 10 races a day, six days a week. The turf course gets a lot of use and therefore gets protected when it rains. Races that are moved to the dirt in wet weather often result in late scratches and small fields, which is not a good thing for betting purposes. For turf horses, a synthetic surface is a better option than a wet dirt track, and that's been proven at the handful of tracks that use synthetic tracks. Synthetic tracks have a short history of about 10 years in the US. Polytrack was installed at Turfway Park, a winter racetrack in Kentucky, and later at Keeneland for its prestigious spring and fall meetings. Arlington Park in Illinois and Prescott Downs in Pennsylvania followed, but the leader in synthetic installation was California. In what I and many others feel was an overreaction, the state mandated the replacement of dirt tracks with synthetic tracks for equine safety reasons. The aim was noble. The result was not, as the tracks are now being removed and replaced by dirt. To me, it seems that A, some corners were cut in the construction. B, there was not enough was known about them and how they were going to react in extreme heat or extreme weather. C, the track maintenance crews were ill-prepared on how to cope with them. The tracks were introduced as maintenance-free, somewhat. In reality, they take a great deal of upkeep. At Fairhill, we are constantly upgrading the track. We add wax and other material to it to maintain its consistency. We monitor it closely. Some California tracks had a big problem with drainage, which shows there was a problem with the installation. The best thing about our track at Fair Hill is it drains so well. But now the synthetic tracks are being replaced with dirt in California, and Keenan is using a new dirt track in for the fall meet, which has started this weekend. Only Arlington Park, Prescott Downs, Golden Gate Fields, Turfway, and Woodbine have synthetic main tracks now partly because of California, trainers were skeptical of the surfaces. So were breeders who have worked to produce dirt horses. Even handicappers have a hard time adjusting to synthetics, which puts wagering handle into question at some tracks. As a trainer, it's nice to know what you're dealing with. You don't get soft synthetic or firm synthetic. When you ship a horse to a synthetic track in the morning, you don't have to worry about how the track will be at race time. Synthetic surfaces aren't perfect. Trainers say they see a lot of new problems with synthetic tracks, but to me, it's not looking at the big picture because there's plenty of information that has shown it greatly reduces catastrophic injury and produces a much safer surface to race on. We want to race on the best surface available for our horses to give horses the best chance of succeeding. You do perhaps see more hind-end issues but is this because we're not noticing as many front-end issues? Statistically, there's evidence that it is so much safer. And this is my point. By abandoning synthetic surfaces, we've turned a blind eye to the safety of the horses. I had recently listened to Dr. Peterson speaking at Fair Hill, as he did today, and he made the same point. 
to talk about the consistency being the goal of any racing, racing or training surface, turf, dirt, or synthetic. The horse is searching for and counting on a consistent surface, and synthetics, when done right, are consistent no matter the weather. As a training surface, I love it. I use it regularly for most of my horses. It's consistent, it's safe. Most people in the US train at racetracks and have no choice but to use a dirt track every day. At some tracks where they have space, it would be great to have the synthetic surface as a training track, even if they only race on dirt and turf. The point is, I believe there is a place for synthetic tracks in America. They shouldn't have been installed as quickly as they were, but they also should not be dismissed. They've proven to be safer, and ultimately, we have a responsibility to the horse. I will gladly take part in Kingland's four meet on a sophisticated, researched, and high-tech dirt track this year. I'm looking forward to it. It's the first new dirt surface with science behind it. If there's something good to come from all of this, it's the research that went into a new dirt surface and the drainage system at Keeneland. Give synthetic tracks some of the credit for this, along with Dr. Peterson's work. It will be fascinating to see how it works. What we should all want is the safety and well-being of the horse. What's the best surface for the horse to race on? It's worth the effort to find out. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, just picking up on an issue which you touched on there, and maybe can I ask Mick a question about the practical implementation of the research uh, that you're doing. Uh, Graham mentioned about the next generation dirt, dirt track in Keeneland. Can you maybe give the audience a little bit of an explanation of what's different about that from previous dirt tracks and how you've been applying the research which you presented to us to practical effect on the racetracks? Mick. Uh, sure. Uh, one of the big things that uh, came into this was from the very beginning the selection of the sand was done and it went to such an extreme that as the sand was being selected they actually had to change suppliers and modify it based on the testing as they went through. Sand is a natural material and when you mine it you can have variation in the material on the mine, from the mine, and so it was actually selectively uh, mined based on x-ray diffraction testing. So that was the goal there was to have a consistent material to start out with. Then at each stage of the assembly, there was, of, of the assembly of the track, there was inspection processes that took place. It was uh, uh, nuclear density measurements of the compaction of the layers, uh, putting it together with a systematic plan and design and put together like it was intended to be the safest possible surface. Finally, as we've moved into this, there is systematic tracking of every maintenance step on the track. And there's a new drainage system that Graham mentioned where uh, there's to, to eliminate the uh, crow's feet that when the water drains to the drains on the inside rail. There's a porous curb that's a new experiment. You know, it's an experiment, like a lot of things, just like the synthetics. And then finally, every piece of equipment that goes out there, it's tracked every day. The moisture is monitored every day, the cushion depth is measured, and this all goes into the database. Like anything else, it may not be perfect on day one, and it's like every other track, what, even the synthetic tracks, that it needs to improve over time. And in, since we're focused on the safety of the horse and the rider, we have to not be complacent. Even if we've improved on current dirt track practice, we need to maintain, we need to continue to move forward. And that's really the attitude that uh, Keeneland's taken on this. Do, do you believe, I mean, uh, one of the points you made is that, that through proper consistent surface, consistent maintenance presentation, have you a preference of one surface over the other, or is it a case that each surface can be, can be both good and bad, as you said to me beforehand? All of our data at this point show that the synthetic surfaces in the United States are more consistent than dirt and turf. But if we look at individual dirt and turf surfaces, we see much better consistency than for general dirt surfaces. Really where we're going here is we need to make every dirt and turf surface as good as the best ones. And that's where, where, how we move the entire industry forward. 
The synthetics, I was, I, I was quite fond of the synthetics. The synthetics were a challenge as they began to age and we began to not understand what was happening to the wax in the synthetics, especially when they were used for training and racing and the heavy, heavy usage that until we practiced with them in the United States, no one had subjected them to the number of horses and training and equipment that they'd seen. As we saw, over time they degraded. That's why there's been the changes in the British track surfaces. You look at the overall cost of that, that's not realistic for this industry to look at replacing these tracks every six to ten years, depending on what, 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 what's happening. However, if we properly maintain these tracks, we see the best dirt tracks are very close to a synthetic track. So if we continue to improve the dirt tracks, that's probably going to have a bigger effect on the safety and health of everyone in the industry, including those who can't afford the capital investment of a synthetic. I'm interested, you spoke there in the past tense that you were quite fond of the synthetic surfaces. Would you then agree with the TGN article which says, do you think it's the end of the synthetic era in, in the US and while there's five now, in five years time there may be none? Um, I, that, that, would, that would be looking into a crystal ball. I, I, I apologize, but what, what needs to be done with the synthetics is there needs to be a continued investment in, in, in that's publicly available, not proprietary that helps us understand these materials, because there is a solution there. And certainly some locations where they have winter race meets, uh, uh, Turfway is, a, is, a, is an excellent example of that. That's a fantastic location. I mean, dirt, a dirt track there would be incredibly difficult to maintain. But there needs to be an investment by the industry to help support those tracks so that they can have the winter meets and have the safe winter meets. Graham, one thing I noticed in, in your speech, uh, and whether this was by accident or by design, I, I hadn't realized. Animal Kingdom's first ever run on dirt was in the Kentucky Derby. Was that, was that supposed to happen, or is it just the way things worked out? No, it was really just the way things worked out. We, we hadn't necessarily thought of him as a, as a derby horse in, in January or February. I, I always imagined if I was going to win the Kentucky Derby, I would know, you know in November or December, but I probably didn't know till April that I was going to win, <laughs> had a chance to win the Kentucky Derby. Um, Barry and I came up with, with the idea that if he handled a workout on the, on the Churchill surface, then that would be our goal. And, and a week before, we f the weather was terrible in Kentucky that, at that time of year. Um, and we finally got to work him on the Churchill surface the week before, and he worked extremely well. And that's what pushed us on to, to give it a chance. And I, I think it is you know, somewhat of an unknown fact and a pretty remarkable fact that I, I think he's the only horse to do that, to win, uh, to win his first dirt start in the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> Unprecedented. Would, would that be, you know, a common practice for you? Would you switch your horses from surface to surface, uh, you know, regularly? Um, and would you be a, a, an exception in that regard? No, I think, I think we all do it a lot. We, ha we have the options so much. And I, I think there is so much more turf racing in the United States now than there was when I started training. Um, you know, I, I remember when we were in Florida, it used to be there'd be one or two turf races a day, whereas now at least half the card on any, any given day will be turf racing. And that's also the case in Saratoga um, and a lot of other, and a lot of, uh, other tracks. So I think, I think it's changed a lot. I think we do switch them back and forwards. I mean, Animal Kingdom was a special horse, and when you have a three-year-old that's showing that kind of ability at that time of year, it, it really behooves you to try, uh, try him on the dirt and see how he handles it, and he handled it very well. And the increase in turf racing is because of better maintenance techniques, better management of the turf? To be honest, the increase in turf racing is a, is a, it's been a way for racing secretaries to, to improve the cards of racing. I think there's been a lot more horses available for turf racing and yeah. the turf races do tend to fill much better than the, than the dirt races. Yeah. And I, I think this has been a little bit what I've been surprised at with the, synthet the demise of the, of the synthetic tracks. I think the synthetic races filled very well because you, you got a little bit of a crossover and you didn't lose the horses in, in the scratches um, on race day when, when there was bad weather. But, but are you the exception, Graham? I know you're an exceptional trainer, but I mean, your colleagues, you, you would seem to be expressing a different view to your training colleagues. Uh, you know, we saw the quotes there from Todd Pletcher and Kieran McLaughlin. Yeah, and I, I think that's a little bit of an unfair stat, perhaps. I think there's a, there's a, there's a large group of us that really liked and appreciated the synthetic surfaces, and I think when they were done well, um, you know, my my point being that there's definitely a place for them, even if it's an alternative to a to a dirt turf course, yeah. um, say at Saratoga, where we have the option to switch 
the turf races to the synthetic or perhaps in the winter we could have another surface. You know, our winters in, in North America are pretty extreme, you know, more extreme than yours would yeah. be. And, and it really is a problem maintaining dirt surfaces in, in the winter. Yeah. Okay. Mick, how many, how many tracks in the States approximately are applying? We, we saw the superintendent in Saratoga there, you know, gathering the statistics and feeding the data into your, into your model. How many tracks are participating in that? There are different, there are different levels of, of participation, but there are uh, seven core tracks that are participating uh, uh, very extensively, and there's another 20 tracks that, uh, that are gradually moving forward. This is a, a sort of a gradual transition, and we're seeing uh, uh, some discussion in other countries moving the same way. Yeah. Uh, internationally, then, the FEI is, uh, is beginning to discuss this same sort of an approach, uh, for, for certainly for the major events. Okay. Any questions? Louis? Yes, Mick, do, Mick, do you have an idea uh, of the cost of the new uh, Keeneland state-of-the-art uh, dirt track compared to the previous synthetic track? Is it one to two, one to three? Uh, what would be, uh, in your mind, uh, the, the difference of cost? I'm an engineer and a bad businessman, so I'm probably the <laughs> last person to ask that. <laughs> so so okay. And Graham, Graham, you, you've been using all of them. How would you compare the cost? Uh, if today you want to have the state-of-the-art uh, track like Inland compared to the cost uh, you have for one of your synthetic tracks? Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine, and again, I'm not an expert, but I would imagine the synthetic tracks are more expensive. I think the, main, I think the problem with synthetic tracks in America is they were introduced as maintenance-free, and that is so far from the truth. I think they take a great deal of maintenance. Um, at Fairhill, you know, we have the Tapita that Michael Dickinson oversees, and we're constantly upkeeping it, upgrading it, um, and, and it's an expensive proposition. I think that's, sadly, I think that's been somewhat of the demise of them in the States, is that people perhaps aren't prepared to put that kind of money into them. And, sorry. And, uh, to put it on, you can. To, I was being somewhat facetious uh, when I said that, too. There's a, there's a big difference in the total cost of ownership. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fixed cost to the synthetic tracks, and the upfront cost, and then the, and, and what isn't known is the replacement cost has been quite uncertain. On the dirt tracks, the day-to-day -day cost is quite high because, as Graham specifically mentioned, I mean, you're talking the labor to keep a tractor going around the track all night, every night during cold weather. You know, that's 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 incredibly expensive. And in some areas of the country, just the water bills for the water for the dirt tracks can be quite 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 expensive. Any more questions? Yes. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Peterson. I have a question about, you talked about maintenance, about how important it is, and obviously um, that's key. Is there, is there a way that the track uh, superintendents or uh, people maintaining the racetracks, are, are they being trained in any particular way? Is there a system? Because it would, it would seem to me that if you're an expert in, tr in maintaining a dirt track, you may not be as good at taking care of a turf track, and then, of course, synthetic. So I love the comparison to the airplanes, but those guys are engineers, they go to school, there's all kinds of training. The question is, um, is there a training process for it? And then, and then I have one, one other question relating to that, and maybe Mr. Cavanaugh can ask this. Um, I, I race and breed in the United States, and the turf racing, if there's a slight drizzle, we have no turf racing for the whole day, and then all the horses that go, that stay in, run in the dirt, and then it's probably not as, uh, as safe, I would guess, I'm just making an assumption. Why is it that in Europe they stay on the grass, and then in the United States we don't stay on the grass? Um, there will there'll be very few tracks in, in Europe, well, not very few, but most of the all-weather tracks in Europe don't have a turf option, uh, certainly in Britain and, and Ireland. Uh, I think in France, there is a turf option in Chanty and Deauville. I don't know what it is with the other ones, but most of the ones that I'm aware of don't have the option of, of switching to the all-weather. No, but they stay on the grass a lot more. Yeah. I'm just curious why they take off the grass. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. So, so to address that specifically on the, on, on the turf in the United States, you're protecting the turf because there's, you're, you're really balancing risks like anything else. And an uneven turf course with divots, because you're going to continue to race on it, 
turf course in the United States has to be managed very differently than, than, than in the United States because we, we have to keep them firm enough so they don't become a, a, a moon scale. Right, yeah, there is no micro, there is no translation. Yeah, well, yeah, there is a problem with the micro. Yeah. Okay. okay, sorry. There, there, there we go. There, the, <laughs> The, the, there's, 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 no, there's no alternative to the, uh, so you become an uneven surface and that's what they're, you're avoiding when you pull them off the turf because you'll damage the rest of the race meat and it's difficult to put in the divots and have the grass grow back and create a safe surface. To speak specifically to the training issue, that is an issue in the United States and, that, and the labor force issues are a big factor in risk to the maintenance of the surfaces. Uh, BHA has done a very good job with their with their turf training program for for training uh, superintendents. Uh, in the U.S., there's there's some movement now and some discussion, and Keeneland has recognized this that there's an opportunity for them to lead and possibly work with New York and 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 some of the other leaders in the industry to essentially take people and and provide an internship opportunity and rotate through because there's very different regional difference. There's regional differences in the way the tracks are maintained, and those are justified by climate. So really, to train a superintendent, they have to see how it's done in different locations. The new assistant superintendent at uh, Keeneland is, came out of a college program, the industry program at Arizona, and went to Saratoga and was hosted very nicely at Saratoga for several weeks to go through a training, and now has gone back to Keeneland. Th there needs to be more of that, because if you look at it as a risk of musculoskeletal disease for the horse, it's not just the top tracks that have to have the excellent maintenance. Those horses are going to ship to the smaller tracks, especially for the big days, and we need to have top quality maintenance at every level of the sport. Graham? I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is that I think my point is in the States, we just have such an opportunity to have synthetics as an option when the, when the races need to be moved off the turf because we just cannot run on soft turf all day because we would ruin the turf course and if if we leave them if we had the synthetic as another option i think we'd keep our cards together and i think in the in in the long run it would be it would way pay for itself and it'd be well worth the investment and also the safety of horses running on a synthetic track as opposed to a, a messy dirt track anyone else okay as as usual the clock has has been our enemy um sorry thierry <coughs> oui, excusez-moi, Thierry Delegue, France Gallo. Je voulais juste savoir si vous aviez pu mettre en évidence. Thierry Delegue, France Gallo. Could you? Oui, je voulais juste savoir si on avait pu. Can you hear the English translation? I wanted to know whether there was a link between the fact that the horse is, has to be medicated and the type of surface that is used, Lasix and Butte, for instance. Is there a relationship between dirt and synthetic concerning medication with Lasix and Butte? Could you catch this? Did you hear this? I told him there'd be no medication <laughs> questions. <laughs> So I'm assuming the question is directed towards is there a link between injuries from, from surfaces or, or, or racetrack surfaces with that? Use of medication. Do you medicate differently for surfaces? I mean, I, I, think, uh, I, I think in general in America we are all wanting to get away from medication. And for me, no, there is, there is no link between uh, medication as far as the surfaces go. Um, you know, I don't know enough about bleeding to know if one perhaps is more prone to bleed on one surface or the other. Um, I think it would be more likely that perhaps the climate would have more to do with that. Um, but I mean, as a generalization, I would say that we are all, you know, pushing to do away with medication. I certainly try to avoid running my two-year-olds on Lasix, for example, um, which I think is, is a step in the right direction and, and hopefully we're, we're, we're going to push that further. I'm not sure I really answered your question, but... Okay. That's great. Um, thank you very much, both speakers. Uh, I think it's a fascinating topic. We, we don't have enough time. Uh, both speakers are available if people want to approach them or talk to them during the break or after the session. Um, 
I took away from, from what Mick uh, said in simple terms, I loved a, an expression he used, precision farming for racing, uh, which I think is a, is, is a great expression. Uh, while the statistics might show that synthetics can be safer than other surfaces, effectively you're saying all surfaces can be both safe and unsafe, and what's key to making them safe is consistency of presentation, maintenance, and research and record keeping. Uh, I think, Graham, for me, uh, you've made a, a strong case that there's a place for synthetic tracks, be it as training tracks or alternative racing tracks uh, in the States, uh, and that you felt that they were brought in too quickly uh, and perhaps are being phased out too quickly. Uh, so they were the two takeaways I took from the session. Uh, and I'd just like, on your behalf, to thank both speakers who've travelled a long way uh, and have been uh, great contributors and I'd like to wish them both continued success in their endeavours in the next few weeks, in particular for Graham. Thank you.